Okay. Thank you all for waiting. Um, appreciate all of you guys actually being here. You can just go directly off the screen. No, no, I'm, this is for the oh, okay. live broadcast. Okay. Great. Well, so um, many of you have already probably encountered that fact that we're actually seeing more single ventricles now than we have uh, normally have been seeing in the past. And so what I wanted to do today was go ahead and actually focus a little bit on, about on single ventricle as opposed to just doing a broad um, description of adult congenital heart disease. So this is going to be very imaging light because I think before we actually even start to talk about imaging, we actually have to talk about what exactly single ventricle physiology looks like. So that's what I'm going to focus on. What you're actually looking at here is what we're going to be talking a lot about today, which is a, um, it, it's a Fontan circulation. Specifically, this is a 40 flow of Fontan circulation. And what you're looking at here, and we'll start off by going over this so that way it'll become a little bit more familiar because repetition is really key to learning. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. And you can actually see how the flows are clashing as they meet together. But what you can see more importantly is that the flows are going into the pulmonary arteries. Okay, and what you're not seeing then is a right ventricle. Okay, so that's the whole point of uh, single ventricle physiology is to be able to give the child not a way to survive without actually having a subpulmonary ventricle and having the only ventricle that the patient has go to the systemic circulation. So with that, we'll go ahead and proceed and talk about how we actually get there. So some of you actually may recognize this patient's condition. So this is a 39-year-old woman with double inlet left ventricle. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of the um, diagnoses that get us uh, to single ventricle because a lot of times that's less important. So this is a patient with double inlet left ventricle. She's previously had a POTS shunt followed by a something called a BT shunt, then a Glenn, then an atrial pulmonary fontan, and then an extra cardiac fontan conversion. She presents with acute renal failure with a creatinine of five and a potassium of six. So this is obviously a bad situation here. Um, worse yet, she's previously already had a catheterization um, in the last several months that actually showed that she had a fontan pressure of 40. So as we move forward, you'll understand why that's actually pretty catastrophic and why the situation is bad. Um, she did well after her um, renal function normalized, uh, but then she returns with ICD shocks and atrial flutter of one to one. You'll see why that is potentially catastrophic as well as we get into this. So let's get into this. So these are the things that we're gonna try to work on a little bit today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the embryological events that sort of get us to a single ventricle physiology, because it may not make sense. How do you actually manage to survive fetal development to actually get to a single ventricle physiology? We'll talk about the initial palliations that, have to, that you have to do neonatally, that you have to look for in a fetal evaluation, and then how you actually get them to survive that first week of life. And then we'll talk about what the typical stages of surgical palliation are for the single ventricle patient and how we're actually going to see them. And then finally, we're actually going to talk about the major complications that we typically see with single ventricle physiology. Again, because we have a lot of very complicated topics to talk about, I'm going to try to go very light um, on the imaging so that we can actually focus on the concepts um, and really sort of get that uh, ingrained. So how do you actually become a single ventricle? It doesn't really make sense, right? So this is sort of the two major types of single ventricle physiology. So on the left, you have hypoplastic left heart, and on the right, you have tricuspid atresia, okay? So basically, one, the hypoplastic left heart will lead you to having only a single right ventricle, okay? And then, of course, tricuspid atresia, the converse will lead you to have only a single left ventricle, okay? So how does that actually happen? Well, they have this concept in pediatric cardiology called the no-flow, no-grow hypothesis, which is if you have an extreme form or you have some type of valvar stenosis, you may not actually have flow into that um, atria or ventricle. Um, because as you can imagine, during development, all four chambers are connected to some degree. And so specifically, some people are now hypothesizing that, say, for example, if you have um, if you have a, a, a either aortic or pulmonic stenosis, what ends up happening is that you end up developing ventricular hypertrophy of the ventricle below that valve. And then what that creates is a restrictive filling pressure, which then creates a situation where the atria doesn't develop well either because you no longer have flow, and therefore that entire side becomes very hypoplastic. And then you have preferential flow through an atrial septal defect. And that's exactly what you would actually start to see if you start thinking about hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So, when you think about hypoplastic left heart syndrome, you can get there in two mechanisms. You can either get there through mitral atresia or you can get there through aortic atresia. And that's actually what we're seeing here in this example. So, um, <laughs> okay. Well, so what, what we're going to go over is this. So, 
what you're seeing is that there is no flow from the left ventricle to the aorta, okay? So in this particular case, it's actually, you're developing a, um, a hypoplastic left ventricle. And then in the tricuspid atresia cases, you can see there's really no real tricuspid valve, and so therefore the right ventricle never truly develops. And this can happen um, either through these types of abnormalities, you can develop them through really severe versions of conotruncal abnormalities, um, but typically speaking, this is something that happens in fetal circulation. And then so when we actually think about why does this baby actually survive, we have to come back to the fact that in fetal circulation, you don't actually require the lungs to work, right? So you actually get your oxygenated blood flow from the placental circulation, which typically comes in through the IVC. And as long as you have some sort of connection at the atrial level, everything will work out just fine. So, um, so let's talk about how palliation of the, in the initial palliation of the single ventricle works. So let's take one of these two different types of physiologies and see if we can actually um, start to uh, get at it. Let me see if I can actually make this pointer work because that would help. Ah, perfect. Okay, so let's start with the hypoplastic left heart. Okay, so these are the typical types of words that you will see in the chart of these patients to get them through that neonatal period. Why? Well, let's talk about what happens when this baby's born. So when this baby is born, okay, you can see very nicely that the, um, that the picture shows you the blue and the red blood flow. Okay? So as you can imagine, your systemic venous circulation comes in the right atrium um, and then goes through the right ventricle. And then normally, just like everybody else, it goes through the lungs. Okay? But when it comes back from the lungs into the pulmonary venous circulation, it comes in the left atrium, but there really is no left ventricle. Right? So then there's preferential flow from the left atrium through the atrial septal defect and mixes in the right atrium into the right ventricle, and therefore you get purple blood flow going out to the pulmonary arteries. So then you might ask yourself, well, how do you actually get blood flow to the coronary arteries? And that is a serious problem. And then how do you get blood flow to the cerebral circulation? And then how do you get blood flow to the systemic, um, the rest of the systemic circulation? And the way that works is that these patients require a patent ductus arteriosus, okay? And so that's a connection between the descending aorta and the pulmonary artery, okay? So if they don't have a fetal diagnosis of single ventricle before they're born, we find out really quickly about five to seven days. Does anybody know why? That's when the ductus closes. And all of a sudden, these kids get very sick and very blue, and sometimes they actually die suddenly at home. Okay, so that's why having that um, prenatal diagnosis is really critical. So, as long as that ductus is open, things are okay, but the ductus is not reliable, right? It's made to involute. It's supposed to involute. If it doesn't involute, the kid gets very sick. So the first thing you have to do is to create a system where you can actually get that, that right ventricle to serve as a systemic ventricle and give you blood flow not only to the pulmonary circulation, but also to the systemic circulation, okay? So there are two ways of getting that. There is the Blalock-Thomas, sorry, Blalock-Towsey-Thomas shunt, which is basically, typically, um, a, sh a connection from the innominate artery to the pulmonary artery, okay? You can imagine where they got that idea from, just like this, okay? So then when the PDA goes away, when you stop the prostaglandins, for example, it doesn't matter anymore because you still have some sort of systemic to pulmonary shunt. The other way to do it is something called a SANO. So a SANO is the idea that in diastole, if you have continued flow from the systemic to pulmonary circulation, you may actually steal from the coronary arteries. Right? And actually, we have seen that. We have seen kids have sudden cardiac death afterwards with evidence of cardiomyopathy when they get resuscitated. Now, you could say it's chicken and egg, right? You don't really know why that's the case. But that could certainly theoretically be a possibility, is that you're stealing, because it's coming right off of here, you're stealing from the coronary blood flow and diastole. So the Sano shunt was an idea that if we connect it from the RV to the pulmonary, I'm, so, I'm sorry, from the RV to the systemic circulation, you can actually get, um, you can actually get um, a, um, I'm sorry, RV to the pulmonary circulation, you can actually get um, uh, a blood flow that doesn't actually uh, shunt away from the coronary arteries um, during diastole. So finally, one of the things that's cropped up recently is the idea of avoiding any type of surgery whatsoever in these patients and getting right to the point. If the PDA is what you want to maintain, why not just stent the PDA, okay? So the concept of the hybrid stage one is that actually instead of doing any of these surgically, just go ahead and get into the PDA and put a stent in there. Now obviously there are a couple different issues now because what we don't want to do, and I, I won't spend too much time on this, but what we don't want to do is over-circulate the pulmonary circulation. So basically if you have all of your systemic circulation going through the pulmonary circulation, that can create a problem because now you're flooding the lungs and then the kid can go into heart failure, right? So you can get pulmonary edema from that. And likewise, it can actually also put you into a situation where ultimately you have um, persistent um, elevation of pulmonary vascular resistance. And that is definitely a problem you want to avoid in these patients.
So that's a sense of why that first week of life, you need to get that shunt done. Because if you don't get that shunt done, the PDA goes away and then the kid will be in big trouble. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So the concept, and actually, let me, let me actually step forward and get to the Norwood, okay? Because that, that's actually where things will actually make a lot more sense, okay? Because it doesn't really make sense without the context of what actually happens in the Norwood. So, so I'm only telling you a little bit, which is the shunt. What we really need to do is the following, okay? So as you can see here, part of the problem with the hypoblastic left heart is everything on the left side is small, okay? Including the aorta. So what you want to do is you want to really augment the size of the aorta so you can really get more of that preferential blood flow to the coronaries as well as the cerebral circulation. Okay, so what they do is they take the pulmonary artery, okay, and they sacrifice it. So, so they'll take the RPA and the LPA off uh, as a stump off of the main pulmonary artery and take that tissue and do a side-to-side -side anastomosis with the aorta to really augment the size of the aorta. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's, that's the main issue with the, um, with the, um, with Norwood. So then you have the shunt, as we talked about. So you have the modified blalactosic shunt. But the other way that you can do this, of course, is instead of actually having an innominate artery to pulmonary artery is the SANO. So in that case, what, instead of doing an artery to pulmonary artery um, shunt, you actually put a graft or a little conduit off of the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. Because remember, right now your pulmonary arteries are not connected to anything, okay? The whole point of this is that you have a very limited calibrated amount of blood flow from the systemic circulation to the pulmonary circulation because too much is too much and then you'll flood the lungs and the kids will have pulmonary edema, okay? So this usually has to be done during the neonatal period for a hypoplastic left heart. And for tricuspid atresia, it's pretty similar in the sense that you need to provide some sort of consistent pulmonary blood flow because as you saw with tricuspid atresia, there is really limited development of the right side of the heart. Oh, sorry, one more thing before we get there. So the other thing that you can notice is really critical to survival is this, okay? Um, so in academic centers, uh, we will and can deliver babies who have a limited a um, atrial septal shunt. But if they don't have a true atrial septal shunt at the point of birth, um, those kids pretty much uniformly die. So a lot of times what we have to do is we have to take them emergently, either deliver them in the cath lab or take them emergently to the cath lab and do a septostomy to make sure that there is adequate blood flow between the left atrium to the right atrium, okay? So a lot of things have to happen at that first week of life. So typically, when you see a patient with single ventricle in adulthood, they've already gone through at least three different types of surgeries. So we've talked about the first one, which is that first neonatal period, okay? But then several months into um, their lifetime, they actually need to move on and have something else done, and that's typically called the Glenn shunt. So the purpose of the Glenn shunt is to really reduce the volume load, because right now your only ventricle is supplying blood flow both to the systemic circulation as well as the pulmonary circulation, okay? So it's doing the entire circulation at this point, okay? So that's a lot to ask of a systemic right ventricle. So the idea of the Glenn is you're gonna take it off now. Um, you're gonna take the ventricle off of that and actually just let your venous circulation supply the pulmonary arteries, okay? So as you can see here, what they've done is you already have the PA disconnected from the main PA trunk, okay? But what you'll see here is they've now connected the SVC to the right pulmonary artery, okay? And what they've done is they've ligated and divided the SVC um, from the right atrium. Okay, so what it does is it reduces the volume load on the single ventricle, allows continued mixed cardiac output through the systemic circulation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And because of this, it's actually frequently termed the 1.5 ventricle circulation. So let's walk through this and think about how the blood flow works in these patients. So this is where we started, right? So this is our Norwood, right, where we have the purple blood flow going through the systemic circulation, and then the blalactosic shunt going from the systemic circulation to the pulmonary circulation, and um, and getting pulmonary blood flow. Then the blood comes back red to the left atrium, goes through the atrial septal defect, and then through the systemic circulation out the aorta, and the process starts all over again, okay? So then when you get to the Glenn shunt, you really wanna have that systemic ventricle doing less, right, because it's really doing double duty at this point. So what you're going to do is you're gonna take down that BT shunt. So you can see it's here, and now it's been ligated and divided. Now you've connected the SVC to the pulmonary circulation, so all the SVC venous blood flow is returning to the pulmonary arteries directly without a right ventricle, okay? And then, of course, they've um, ligated and divided the SVC connection to the um, right atrium. But then what happens to the IVC blood flow? Well, the IVC blood flow continues to go through into the common atrium, right, because you've created a right atrial, left atrial shunt that's continuous. So the IVC goes in the right atrium, which goes into the systemic ventricle and gets mixed, so you now have purple blood in the systemic ventricle, and you continue to have purple blood going to the aorta, okay? Any ideas why we'd want to continue to do that at six months or so? 
So the idea is that this is a backup, right? Because one of the problems that you can encounter is if you have pulmonary vascular resistance problems, right, and you're living basically off of venous circulation to the pulmonary vascular resistance, that could be a disaster if you have a pulmonary vascular resistance problem. This is a pop-off, right? It allows you to continue to have venous blood flow returning to the systemic circulation and sacrifices your oxygen, your oxygen level for maintaining cardiac output, okay? So you continue to have IVC blood flow into the systemic circulation, and then you have some mixing. And so typically these kids have a SAT of about 80-something percent. Sometimes you may actually see this phrase, bilateral glen. So what that means is that the patient actually has a persistent left-sided SVC. So, Fellows, where does the persistent left-sided SVC usually typically go to? CS. Yes. CS, right. So the idea is what you don't want to do is you don't want to have that left-sided SVC, all the blood flow from the left side of the upper um, body go directly to the systemic circulation, right? Because you've only got half of it now going to uh, the right, uh, sort of the pulmonary circulation. So what you want to do is you want to go ahead and hook up the left SVC to the pulmonary circulation as well. So if you hear the term bilateral, Glen, that's what that means. A bidirectional glen just means that you have a connect, direct connection from the SVC to the pulmonary artery and the blood flow goes both to the left pulmonary artery as well as to the right pulmonary artery. The classic glen was where they actually took the RPA, ligated and divided it, and, and took it directly to the SVC, and that was a unidirectional glen. So that's <laughs> why we use the phrase bidirectional glen. Okay, any questions before we move on here? So this is obviously not a great situation for kids who are running around, right? So typically by the time we get to toddlerhood, we want to get them so that they're not blue all the time. And that's what the Fontan is. So this is, we typically call it a Fontan completion because this is the destination that we're trying to get them to. And the idea is that we take the complete cardiac output and send it through the pulmonary circulation, which is what we call effective pulmonary blood flow, right? So you no longer have this venous blood flow going to the systemic circulation and shunting past. You're actually gonna send it all to the pulmonary circulation. So what you're seeing here is that you've now taken the IVC and you've attached an extra cardiac conduit. So in this, typical, in this case, it's uh, typically used a Gore-Tex conduit, usually about 20, 22 millimeters in diameter, and connected directly to the Glen circuit, okay, so the underside of the pulmonary arteries, okay? And now, uh, basically, you have no more uh, right-to-left shunting anymore, so you no longer have the IVC flow going into the systemic circulation. The systemic circulation comes back strictly from the left atrium, goes into the uh, systemic ventricle, and it gets pumped into the systemic circulation. So blue is blue, red is red, okay? However, you can imagine that when you do this surgery, some of these kids tend to be a little bit rocky at the beginning, and they can have elevated um, problems with their elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. Especially, what are sort of the things that happen to us when we're post-op? I'm sorry? Arrhythmias. Arrhythmias, right, that's one. Hypoxia. Hypoxia, right, that's another, right? Acidosis. I'm sorry? Acidosis. acidosis, right. But what do we do typically for acidosis, hypoxia, and things like that? We tube patients, right? We put them on mechanical ventilation. What happens when you elevate your, um, your PEEP and your, um, your, C, your um, positive airway pressure? Well, yeah, so everything you guys said, but more specifically in this particular situation, you're increasing the resistance of your venous circulation going back to your pulmonary arterial circulation. So PEEP can literally kill a Fontan patient. Okay, because basically you're just gonna decrease the blood flow. In fact, many people actually think that the reason why you actually get this forward blood flow to the lungs from the venous circulation is because you're actually using intrathoracic pressure as part of your cardiac output. Okay, in fact, there was actually a recent study that was just um, described where they actually use negative intrathoracic pressure or something like the iron lung to allow you to have improved cardiac output. Okay, so a lot of times what they'll actually do when they do this Fontan conversion, if they're a little bit concerned about it, is they'll actually put a hole that connects from the Fontan circuit to the systemic atrium, okay? And the idea is that if the pressure rises too high in the Fontan because there's some issue with pulmonary vascular resistance, then you can actually shunt from right to left and sacrifice your oxygen saturation for it better cardiac output. Okay, and that's also something that we often do if the Fontan pressures are severely elevated um, in patients who are adults with Fontan circulation. Okay, so all sounds awesome, right? This is like the perfect world. You know, these kids are about three to five years of age when they get the Fontan conversion, but obviously it's not because otherwise we wouldn't be seeing those adults. So what types of Fontans are there and why do they actually matter? Well, so the classic Fontan, um, which was the first one described in the 70s and 80s, is, um, is called an atrial pulmonary Fontan. And the idea was you do this in one step. You do the whole thing in one step. You basically take the right atrial appendage and you, um, and you anastomose the end to side to the pulmonary artery. 
Okay. Um, another way to do this is to actually do the left, uh, the right atrial appendage and uh, anastomosis to the left pulmonary artery and then have the glen from the SVC to the right pulmonary artery. Okay, and I'll show you that in a second. We'll talk about why that's not a great thing and that's why people don't do that anymore. The second type of Fontan is called the lateral tunnel Fontan. So typically today, kids will get either lateral tunnel Fontan or an extra cardiac conduit or extra cardiac tunnel. Okay, and so the lateral tunnel Fontan basically uses, again, a piece of graft that sits inside the atrium and uses part of the atrial wall to form that conduit. And the idea is that you're only using part of the atrial wall to form the conduit, not the entire thing. There are a couple different advantages of this. One of them being that if you need to get back over to the systemic atrium, you can. You can perforate through this baffle, um, which we'll talk about why that becomes important in a minute. Um, and then, of course, we just talked about the extra cardiac conduit, which is basically just directly connecting the IVC to the pulmonary artery using an extra cardiac um, conduit completely that has nothing to do with the systemic atrium at this point in time. So why do we not do this anymore? So this is one of my patients. And let's see, we'll actually walk through this. There we go. Sorry not pointing very well. So what we're looking at here is a classic Fontan and a tricuspid atresia patient. So you can see here, there's something very, very gigantic here. And this is the atrial pulmonary Fontan. And you can see here the SVC, right? But more importantly, you'll see where it connects to the pulmonary artery circulation. So the problem with this, of course, is if you have the entire pulmonary vascular resistance sitting on the right atrium, eventually this right atrium is going to become gigantic like you see here. Okay? And so this becomes a problem for these patients. Oh, here we go. Here's that right atrial appendage. So here's the right atrial appendage, and then you can see the pulmonary circulation coming off of it. And so you can see why this becomes a problem. Half the chest now is right atrium. Okay? And so when you have a dilated right atrium like this, what happens? Any guesses? Well, okay, thrombus, right? But more importantly, you just said it. Arrhythmias, okay, atrial arrhythmias. So what do you think happens to a Fontan in atrial arrhythmias? Badness, right? So why? Because it's at the core. I mean, the exactly. Right. right, exactly. You're living basically off of diastolic function, right? So if your systemic ventricle has problems with diastolic function because you have no atrial kick, that patient's going to get really sick really quickly, okay? And so we typically try medical therapy, okay? Because trying to ablate this is a nightmare, right? I mean, your catheter is just swimming in a gigantic right atrium that's half the chest. The other possibility then is to do what's called a Fontan conversion, okay? So we haven't done one here yet, but the idea is that you're going to take this and you're going to convert it to either a lateral tunnel Fontan or an extra cardiac conduit. And the idea is you're just going to completely remove this right atrial tissue so it's no longer nidus for atrial arrhythmias, okay? Because these patients can get very, very sick. They can come in with heart failure over and over and over again when they start developing these uh, refractory atrial arrhythmias. And again, like I said, it's pretty hard to actually ablate this successfully. So, um, and then of course, to give you a little bit more perspective, this is what Mon was referring to. This is what blood flow looks like, okay? You can see how this could be a serious nidus for thrombus. Now, luckily, she hasn't had any yet, but it's just a matter of time. Okay, and you can see for perspective the size of her atrium versus the size of her systemic left ventricle. Okay, so typically that's a problem for these patients, and typically we, try, we do try to convert them, and that's exactly the story that happened with this patient that we were talking about. So the second thing that becomes a problem as we move along is that when you have this extra cardiac conduit, right, you have no connection to the right atrium. Okay, so then you have the opposite problem. When you start to develop atrial arrhythmias like this patient that we had in-house, there's no way of getting there, right? So how do you actually get from the systemic, the venous circulation into the right atrium? There may be actually daylight between the, um, the conduit and the systemic atrium, okay? So the other possibility is to go retrograde, okay? But obviously that's not very easy, okay? Especially when you have very complicated systemic ventricular anatomy. So that's, that's just the beginning of what we deal with in Fontan. So now let's talk about what Fontan failure actually means, okay? So one of the things that we often deal with um, in these patients who are cyanotic at some point in their lives, right, is, um, is aortic pulmonary collaterals. So the concept is because you have so much reduced blood flow to the pulmonary arteries, whether it's from the initial shunt, 
Um, so initially when they have the blalactosic shunt or down the line when they've got the glens, they typically develop these collaterals. And the idea is that you're going to have systemic to pulmonary collaterals. Okay, so you develop these small bronchioles that get very enlarged. You can also develop collaterals coming off the internal mammary arteries. You can develop collaterals coming off the, uh, the subclavian arteries, the lateral thoracics, etc. And they all head for the pulmonary arteries because the body is trying to find a way to give you more pulmonary blood flow. Okay, and when you hear the surgeons uh, talk about transplant and collateral bleeding, that's typically the problem. Okay, is these types of collaterals because now you have systemic circulation going through them and just bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, okay? And so the problem with our, our single ventricle patients is this is a shunt, right? So you have a systemic to pulmonary shunt. It's almost like having a PDA. Now you're loading that systemic ventricle with additional load, okay? So that's one problem. The second problem, of course, is that um, you also have this problem where these vessels are fragile, okay? And so these patients can bleed. So this is what it typically looks like. So this is internal mammary that you can see somebody worked very hard to coil the entire thing, but we still have these, um, these collaterals. And you can see they're all going to the lungs. And so you can imagine why these vessels are so friable and these patients can present with hemoptysis. So about three or four years ago, we actually had a patient who prevent, presented with massive hemoptysis. And that is a problem that we can typically see, especially in our patients who actually continue to be blue um, in adulthood. And so what we use typically is um, this, which is uh, embolic particles um, to knock off those vessels. And so you can see this is what it looks like after we knocked off some of those vessels. So just a couple more things and we'll be done. So what I'm showing you here, and it's not playing, um, but basically what we've done here is we've actually perforated through. So we've gone from the IVC and we've perforated back into the systemic atrium. And what we've done here is to create a fenestration. And that is for basically the end stage Fontan patient who has elevated Fontan pressures. So the idea is that if the systemic ventricle has an end diastolic pressure or the systemic atrium has a pressure that's less than the Fontan pressure, you could potentially save them by perforating through the Fontan into the systemic atrium and creating a conduit there, basically by putting a stent in there. Because what you can do is you can decompress the Fontan again, like the original uh, Glenn's circuit where you actually sacrifice the oxygenation or oxygen, uh, oxygen level for maintaining cardiac output. And that's what you would do in a patient with a very low cardiac output state in, the, in Fontan failure. But of course, there are other problems with Fontan. Protein losing enteropathy is one of the ones that's really the bane of uh, our existence. What tends to happen is because they have this chronic congestion of the venous circulation, they tend to leak, in, leak protein into their gut. And so they can drop their albumins into the twos or even ones. The problem is we don't really know how to fix the problem. Um, we think subcutaneous heparin, um, oral steroids, um, uh, octreotide, things like that may have some limited benefit, but really the only thing that can actually fix it is getting rid of the Fontan circulation. Bronchial cast is something we typically see more often in kids, but it's the same concept. You have this oozing of protein into the bronchi and they form these rigid casts inside the bronchi and you can't ventilate the patient anymore. You actually have to take a rigid bronchoscope to remove these casts out of the, pulmonary the, the bronchi. It seems now that we're finding that from the time of converting that kid to a Fontan, we find fibrosis in the liver. So it's almost universal that if you image these kids, you will find fibrosis in the liver. So by the time they reach adulthood, most of them will have some degree of cirrhosis, if not frank, um, I'm sorry, if not frank liver failure. The other thing is, of course, they're at very high risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And then, of course, we talked about elevated Fontan pressures as well as aorta pulmonary collaterals. So that's pretty much it. I just wanted to take some time to give a quick um, highlight of how single ventricles actually work, how do we actually get there, and what actually are the problems that we deal with, because I think we're gonna start seeing them more and more here, um, uh, given current circumstances. So with that, I'll leave it. Come on up and ask me any questions if you have any.